Uh, there was a fellow who asked the question in uh, uh, regards to extinction. I just, I'm just going to cover his question because um, I think it's important to go through the little steps there. Okay, so let's go with this question. And he says the following. If I can get it up here. Ah. Uh, what mechanism did you think of for the sudden disappearance of some types of plants that were direct and unique nourishment for some animals? Remember, the theory is that um, uh, we had um, collapse of the ecological collapse, essentially, the overturning of the ecological pyramid. And what disappears is primary production. And that's what he's referring to here, okay? Okay, so um, let me start by clarifying this. Okay, we want to distinguish background extinction from mass extinction two different mechanisms according to this site okay to this channel okay mass extinction many species background extinction one species disappears okay um what's the general mechanism in the case of a mass extinction and again we're talking about animals here okay overturning of the ecological pyramid and in the uh, background extinction is the overturning of the population pyramid it's the demographic pyramid that overturns what causes the first one? The overturning of the population pyramid of plants. Okay, the plants um, suffer their long-term uh, decline, finally, and all animals that forged a relationship with these plants for millions of years, all these families, they go down with the plants. The ones that ate these plants die, and then the carnivores that ate the right. plant eaters die. And, and the other issue there is that they can't switch at the last moment. You know, a, a rabbit doesn't go from lettuce to, uh, to um, bark or to Christmas tree leaves, you know, uh, from morning to night. He can't switch overnight. And in the case of the um, background extinction, what causes it are extensive inbreeding, the founder's effect, and population bottlenecks. That's in general terms. And there's the example of uh, John Calhoun's Mouse Utopian Universe. He ran many experiments. They all ended in extinction uh, because what happens again is you have a group of animals that are born or uh, expand uh, uh, demographically from very few grandfathers. Okay, so that's essentially it. And let me put this up here now. And that's a little disclaimer for uh, when we talk about the aging of a species. Okay, Whether a species is old according to Mother Nature has nothing to do with how many times the Earth went around the sun. Okay, uh, It has to do with something else. And here are the telltale, telltale signs that a species is likely old. And you'll note that all of these refer to man. Man is an old species. Uh, what are these uh, uh, signs, clues? Uh, numerous individuals, high density, we're, what, 8 billion people? Uh, large, uh, for a given species, we're a large mammal, and among the primates, we, we are also big. And that's known as today as Koch's Law. That means that animals, uh, you know, start out relatively small, and over time, they grow bigger and bigger and bigger. Okay, and that's how the T-Rexes became big, and that's how we became big. They're sedentary. They no longer colonize the land. We can no longer colonize the land. We have already colonized the land. Okay. T-Rex has colonized the land? Yeah, when you reach a certain region and then you don't expand anymore, essentially you become sedentary. You, you don't migrate anymore for whatever reason. You know, that's the end of you. <laughs> uh, the redwoods in California, they're sedentary as well. They, don't, they used to migrate. I mean, they used to cover the planet in different parts and they no longer migrate. Endemic diseases, uh, they become resistant to it, and that's part of the reason, you know, they're sedentary, they get used to the diseases locally, and they are able to withstand them after a while, after a trial and error, okay? Low reproduction and also low genetic diversity. Those are, in general terms, the characteristics of a, a species that is old. And we meet all those conditions, humans, okay? Not that we're going to die in a background extinction. But uh, if you look at the Neanderthals, they also met all those conditions, okay? Okay, um, so I'm going to talk, to answer this gentleman's uh, question, I'm going to talk about the Permian, because I think that's a pretty good example of what, of how the animals disappeared because of food, okay? What changed was their environment, and by their environment, I mean their food, not, not anything else, not the weather, the climate, anything like that. And here you have a little map of Pangaea, this is what uh, the... Permian looked like in those days, the end of uh, the Permian, 252 million years ago. And in the south, you'll see that green area uh, that was covered by Glossopteris, a type of seed fern that covered all those regions. And that's how they think that all these uh, pieces of continents, or some are continents in the, uh, today, uh, were pieced together. They were, they were part of the same puzzle because this plant covered that whole region. And so did some of the animals that lived in those days. They can find them in all these same places. 
and uh, Pangaea is divided into two parts, uh, Gondwana, which is the uh, southern part of, you know, south of the equator, and north you have Laurasia. In Laurasia, uh, you get to Russia, and you get to Perm, the, the region of Perm, that's where the word Permian comes from. And there you will find also seed ferns. You have Tatarina, Persongia, and Permothica. And all these are seed ferns. They disappeared together with the Glossopteris in the southern hemisphere. And yeah, it's very coincidental when these plants disappeared, um, the animals disappeared. <laughs> so it's kind of coincidental, wouldn't you think? And did seed ferns die out completely? No, in the uh, Triassic, you have uh, the Dicroidiums, which is a different type of um, seed fern that continued. But it was a seed fern that uh, these animals wouldn't have eaten. Uh, remember, the Triassic was the age of the archosaurs, crocodile-like animals. that They governed the uh, Triassic for the most part. And they ate dicrodiums. Uh, the herbivores of that age ate dicrodiums. And you say, well, a seed fern is a seed fern. Isn't it the same thing? Animals can eat one or the other. Well, that's like me asking you if you can eat weeds. I mean, weeds are angiosperms, and they're flowering plants. Well, we don't eat weeds. We, we eat lettuce, maybe tomato, you know, maybe some orange or whatever. But we don't eat, uh, <laughs> we don't eat these uh, weeds. And they're all angiosperms. And that's how you have to look at this. Dicrodiums are not the same thing as uh, these uh, glossopteras. Okay, they were different types of seed plants, uh, seed ferns, you know, plants. And so they couldn't switch overnight to the dicrodiums. Okay, that's in general terms. Um, these are the animals you'll find in the south uh, area in South Africa, known as the Karoo. And you look at those, you say, okay, yeah, that looks like a lion, and the other one looks like a hippopotamus, maybe, you know, moss chops and uh, bradysaurus. And uh, there's a little difference between these animals and what we have today. And let me give you a, an example here so that you can put it in the right context. Imagine a lion that lays eggs. Okay, does that make sense? You say, oh, what do you mean a lion that lays eggs? Well, these animals, as you, as you see them, they laid eggs. So they're known as mammal-like reptiles. They have more reptilian uh, characteristics than they had mammalian. Okay, and so, uh, you know, that's, that's the type of animal that uh, disappeared in the Karoo, okay? Up north in Siberia, uh, you had, uh, there's the region, you have the Perm region, you have the Sokolki uh, assemblage zone, that's where they find a lot of these animals and plants, that's uh, heavily studied today, that whole, the, that whole region, and these are the animals that you'll find in there, you'll find Inostrancevia, okay, which is a uh, type of, I guess, tiger, lion, whatever you want to think of that is, and you had uh, Scutosaurus, uh, which was a pariasaur, and the types of plants, as again, you see them there on the right, Okay, and they were seed ferns. That's what they look like, more or less. That's how we have reconstructed them today. And you'll read on the bottom left there that there were four orders of these seed plants, and they're referred to pterosperms. And I'm not even going to bother pronouncing these things. I don't know why the paleontologists <laughs> invent all these weird names for them. But uh, essentially, these seed ferns uh, were around. They were maybe 90% of the flora out there at the time. In some places, there were only some of these plants. And when they disappeared, what do you think the animal's going to eat? He's going to switch overnight and say, well, I think I'm going to eat conifers now, which was the next uh, group of plants to come, you know, into the uh, landscape. Are they going to switch overnight and say, oh, I'm, I'm going to start eating cycads now? No, never happened, never will. Okay, they can't switch overnight, not after forging a relationship of millions of years. I bet they tried on their last days. <laughs> I don't think so, you know, it's like... You get hungry enough, I'll, uh, you'll, I'll eat eat, you'll eat bark. <laughs> well, I'll try it. A lot of people will say that. I don't know if I'll digest it, but I'll try it. I'll yeah, that's it. another one. Uh, one thing is that you want to eat to fill your stomach. You know, some people that uh, were uh, caught in a situation where they were starving, they started eating bark in desperation. Eat lettuce, and, lettuce, and, and, and it, Yeah, and it doesn't help them because it's not food for the body. It's not nutrients. So you can't... You can eat it. I mean, you can swallow it and maybe it calms your stomach, but it doesn't do anything for your body because <laughs> it just goes through. You don't have the uh, you don't have the bacteria that can you know digest all that stuff for you. Okay, uh, important to note uh, there. This was the only insect extinction that happened also in the Permian, and we read you see there it says the end Permian is the largest known mass extinction of insects. According to some sources, it is the only insect mass extinction. And they say insects were piercing and sucking mouth parts began to decline during the mid Permian, and these extinctions have been linked to what? To a change in flora. Okay, and from the, uh, you know, with the end of the Paleozoic, uh, you enter this region, this, this age, that lasts even until today where the insects essentially uh, can tell who their grandfathers were. Before that, you know, they, uh, the insects that belonged uh, before that became extinct and completely. And here, let me give you some examples. Uh, this fellow here, he's known as Arthropleura. And uh, he lived in the Carboniferous. Is that a big centipede? Yeah, two and a half uh, meters. <laughs> you can see the size of that. And there's the, uh, there's the fossil. And 
you look at that monster and you say, Jesus, I don't want to see him in a dark alley, you know, and it turns out he was a herbivore. Yeah, this, this animal was a herbivore. Dodged the bullet. Yeah, they, they figured out uh, by their stomach contents, that kind of stuff, that, or the plants that were around them for different reasons, or the mouth parts and so on, they decided he was a uh, herbivore. But in the uh, Permian, you get this monster, okay? And this is a little uh, dragonfly. Little. Uh, yeah, two, two feet long um, uh, wingspan. wingspan. And, um, and this guy was a carnivore, okay? And maybe he grew that big because he didn't have too many enemies, especially when he got to, to that size. He pro you know, you probably wanted to avoid him, not to hunt him down. You don't need a fly swatter, you need a baseball bat. <laughs> oh, yeah, so these were big monsters that you had in those days. All those animals, animals, right, insects, right? Uh, they disappeared, and then a new wave of insects that lasts even until today, essentially, you know, covered the land. And uh, so all I can show you uh, to answer the question here is the plant evolution. This gives you a, a, a snapshot of what I'm talking about. You know, you have uh, different ages, and every age has its plant, and every age, because it has a certain type of plant, it also has a certain type of animal that depends on that plant. Herbivores first, and carnivores that, you know, live off the fat of the land, off the herbivores. And, you know, you have the uh, early part, uh, I'm just going as far back as the Debonian and Carboniferous, and you'll see the non-vascular and early vasculars, you'll have the horse tails. You know, you have certain type of plants that essentially disappeared today. Uh, there are other varieties of horsetails today, but nothing to do with the ones that existed in the Carboniferous. From there, we went to the age of ferns, you can call it, specifically the seed ferns, but, you know, ferns after all. And those were the Permian and Triassic. Then when you have the Jurassic, which is known as the age of cycads, Jurassic was all cycads. All these other plants vanished completely. And they were in the background, like the, uh, you have ferns in the background, but they're not the primary part of the landscape. They have the flora. And then, uh, you know, when uh, the angiosperms, I showed the graph the other day, the angiosperms displaced the conifers, uh, that's when we came into being, and that's when the dinosaurs disappeared. So I'm saying that when the plants die, that these uh, species, these families of species, uh, force a long-term relationship with, when the plants go, so do the animals go. And that's why we don't see dinosaurs around today. Okay? In a way of speaking, it's as if all the food we ate disappeared but food that other animals eat was still around. And that's what differentiates why some animals survive. That's, that's the, that's the uh, discriminating factor. One food chain goes away because it depends on a certain type of flora, yeah, you know, the cool. herbivores on that and the carnivores on that, on those guys. And all the others are even uh, are completely unaffected to, uh, with what happens you know, to the, the big guys. Usually it's the big guys that go away. And the small guys who are radiating with the new vegetation they don't know what's going on. They say, hey, you know, we don't have the big guy stomping on us anymore. <laughs> Let's think, expand. I think that's an important part that's never taught in schools and stuff. Yeah. They always talk about the circle of life and, like, the food chain, but they don't talk about food chains with plural. There's plural yeah, food yeah. chains parallel to each other. Yeah, yeah, one yeah. can go down without the other one falling. But yeah, yeah, usually yeah. it's spoken as in the food chain as if everyone is connected. Yeah, and that's not, that's not true because not... Everyone is connected. There could be maybe a little, a tiny connection, maybe at the insect yeah, level, yeah, yeah. that maybe it's so far uh, removed from us that that's not what supports us. I'll give you an example. In the Cretaceous, what died were the diatoms uh, and the other foraminifera and um, uh, plankton in general. Those were eaten by the ammonites and the uh, mosasaurs, which were these big monsters, reptiles, not, not fish, reptiles that lived in the sea. They ate, or they subsisted primarily on, on ammonites. This was a food chain. And guess what? You know, all three of them disappear. Now, now that's kind of weird, isn't it? That the, the just the them. three that disappear. Yeah. The, <laughs> just the asteroid hit exactly those three. <laughs> just hit them right on the nose. Yeah, yeah it's, uh, it's very strange that that would happen. Now, you would think that it's got something to do with food, and that's Mother Nature's um, henchman, <coughs> food. That's what she uses to kill species massively in a mass extinction, okay? And so that's the answer to this gentleman's question.